towards our panel discussion as well. We'll be having questions throughout the session. I would like to request Dr. Rajiv Rajendra Nath sir uh, for having few comments regarding today's presentation or any issue you want to raise. Dr. Rajiv. Yeah. So good afternoon all. I, I am very happy to attend this because there were two excellent presentations that happened. And uh, the professor Nick has told uh, very nicely the impact of new adjuvant chemotherapy and the discussion that followed, which showed that you know in, even a hormone positive subset, what to do whether new adjuvant chemo or new adjuvant hormones. So if you look at the data, if you look at new adjuvant chemotherapy in a ERPR positive or two negative, then the PCR rates are only 11%. So one of the important uh, endpoint is a PCR, which translates into improved DFS and OS. So if you have a ER positive and a R2 negative subset, then the benefit of a new adjuvant chemotherapy is limited. And that's where in some of the subset, we might consider new adjuvant hormones. And when we are considering new adjuvant hormone, the important point is uh, the cutoff points are different. We need to give it at a prolonged, as Professor Nick mentioned, we need to give it at a longer duration because we don't expect the uh, immediate responses that we see in chemotherapy. So we actually will be waiting for six months to nine months. Usually our cutoff is around six months before we assess for surgery. So we need to be patient when we give new adjuvant hormones. And uh, the most uh, uh, robust data is with letrozole as far as the PCR in new adjuvant hormones are concerned. Uh, now, coming to the duration of new adjuvant chemotherapy as uh, has been practiced in Bangladesh, we were also practicing sandwich technique during our training period where we used to give three or four cycles, then do surgery and then uh, give adjuvant. But then we also saw that in practical terms also, there is a lot of delay and there is break in between chemotherapy and the dose density is not really uh, maintained. So majority of our patients also get the total new adjuvant therapy now. So they complete all chemotherapy and then go in for surgery, which is as the practice elsewhere. And we have seen that the PCR rates have improved after practicing total new adjuvant therapy. So that's as far as the first presentation is concerned. For as Dr. Jyoti's excellent presentation, again, uh, young people, uh, young ladies with breast cancer is a, uh, is a problem in India, and I'm sure it is a problem in Dhaka also. And uh, where we see that there are more triple negatives, and we need to be looking at uh, testing for BRCA for almost all of them, and uh, thereby have a proper pre-test genetic counseling, and thereby counseling, as Dr. Jyoti mentioned, more importantly, the family members also. And now with uh, medications like Olaparib being available, doing a BRCA becomes more therapeutically relevant for a particular patient apart from risk-reducing surgery of uh, contralateral breast cancer and oophorectomy. So very excellent presentation. I am honored to be here and uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for your excellent uh, comment. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. Tan for your valuable comment. Tan, sir. Hi, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me all the way to participate in this very useful and interesting symposium. I totally agree with all the speakers, Pro Professor Nick, Dr. Jyoti, and our good friends, that the role of neoadjuvant therapy has been slow in the uptake until recently. And I think it is most important that the subset of those uh, HER2 positive and triple negative are the ones that benefit most. And also, especially in the HER2 positive, the rate of PCR, whether it's PCR or partial uh, complete remission, will determine the kind of anti HER2 therapy that needs to be followed. And the Catherine study has illustrated the importance of uh, the, doing a proper neoadjuvant chemotherapy with anti-HER2, and then doing surgery, and then determining whether it's a complete remission. If there's a complete pathological remission, the patient just continue on the, the anti-HER2, <clears throat> like trastuzumab. Whereas if it is a partial complete remission, then the role of uh, uh, TDM1 plays a very important, <coughs> and this study to me is practice changing and has 
really influence the way we uh, adopt this treatment. But I think the most important part of neoadjuvant therapy is what we call the team effort. You know, I think in the the management of breast cancer, there must be a team of uh, surgical oncologists, breast surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, coming together and interacting to decide which set, subset of patients should benefit most from neoadjuvant therapy. And I think this uh, collaborative multidisciplinary approach is very important. Another advantage of neoadjuvant therapy is unlike adjuvant therapy where you're giving chemotherapy without realizing how useful the drugs that you are giving. And until recently, there have been a variety of adjuvant therapy. But in new adjuvant therapy, you really get an in vivo testing of sensitivity of the drug to the chemotherapy that you give. So I think more and more doctors and especially surgeons are willing to pass their patients uh, to uh, medical oncologists to offer new adjuvant therapy as an upfront way of managing this subset of patients. It took a while for a lot of my surgical colleagues to accept this, but I think with all the data and with their education, more and more of them are adopting this uh, way of treating. The lecture by Dr. Jyoti is very useful and very uh, uh, learning because I think the role of uh, genetic testing is getting very important. We are seeing a lot of young women with breast cancer, and it is important that we do the testing, not only to help to decide what kind of surgery and also the implication to the siblings, to the uh, descendants, uh, very important. And as been mentioned earlier, now we have PUP inhibitors. We have now two PUP inhibitors that are very dependent on whether there's BRCA1 or 2 mutation. The Olaparib and Telizoparib has been recently approved. And that is also a very important uh, way of testing. But the uptake of patients, I don't know whether in Bangladesh or India, uh, or people doing genetic testing is good. But in Singapore, there's still a lot of reluctance. A lot of family do not want to know that they have inherited a gene like this and they can pass on to their descendants and can influence uh, the siblings. Another point is on the ovarian ablation in young women uh, with breast cancer. And I think it is now the soft and tech study have illustrated the importance of doing uh, ovarian ablation. And as has been discussed, Sometimes the cutoff age is a little bit arbitrary, whether it's 35 or 40 or even earlier. In my own practice, I use 35, 40 as my cutoff age, depending on the situation. And I do offer uh, new, uh, I mean, uh, ovarian sub ablation. But we also got to realize that in ovarian ablation, you actually decrease the quality of life. A lot of women do not like the lack of estrogen. They, their sexual health get affected. And there are a lot of implications uh, to offering ovarian ablation too. So these are some of my comments. But otherwise, I thought this webinar is extremely useful and I hope educational for everyone who logged in. Thank you, sir, for your valuable comments and being with us for so long time for in our previous you, conferences and in this virtual event as well. We really appreciate on behalf of our society, your kind presence in our seminars and guiding us. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's too bad that uh, because of COVID, uh, my good friend, Professor Kamru Zaman is unable to organize another Bangladesh Breast Cancer Conference uh, this year and uh, and we miss seeing each other at the, at the conference as we did the last year. So we hope this virus will go away soon and we can meet each other face to face. 
uh, yes, Professor John, uh, can you can here to organize the conference, the especially not. <laughs> Well, we also feel exactly the same. Thank you so much. Especially we'll organize in November next year, if COVID goes away. Yeah, we in hope it will go away. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, at least we can see each other in a virtual space, which is yeah. better than nothing. And I think yeah. the most important is the exchange of ideas and yeah. experience and yeah. knowledge is very important in exactly, managing our patients with breast cancer. Uh, at this moment, I would like to request Professor Kaji Monjur Kader Sar uh, for his valuable comment regarding today's presentation. Monjur Kader Sar. It's my pleasure to say about Professor Dr. Jyoti Bachpayi from Tata Memorial Hospital for her very brilliant presentation of today's new adjuvant chemotherapy in case of breast cancer. Her presentation was very much informative and very much highly scientific and useful for we people who are practicing in oncology. And another presenter, Dr. Nick from Australia, I would like to give thank you for his brilliant presentation also. Thank you all. I express my deep gratitude to Professor Kamru Jaman for asking me to join this session as a panel, uh, as an expert in this panel. And it's very, uh, very nice to see Professor Tan, who is an old friend of mine as well. After a long time, we are seeing each other though not physically, but virtually. For the presentations, I, uh, Professor Nick uh, uh, presented about the new adjuvant chemotherapy. And this is more applicable for triple negative breast cancer. Both of these situation, new adjuvant chemotherapy and triple negative breast cancer, I, am, uh, I have special interest in both these situations. The problem in new adjuvant chemotherapy in this country is putting a marker, either carbon or a clip, except in one and two centers, as Dr. Forit said. Fortunately, we are working in the same center now in BRB hospitals, and uh, he's helping us uh, in putting the clips in patients who are receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. The other problem is periodic measuring, periodically measuring the uh, tumor uh, response. Though patient herself is the best uh, uh, predictor, uh, uh, best judge who can say whether the tumor is decreasing in size or it's becoming softer, but one has to measure it image, with image so that we do not go wrong because once the tumor is uh, increasing in size and doesn't show a, a response to new adjuvant chemotherapy, immediately the patient should be subjected to surgery. That is the principle of, of, of neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant hormone therapy. The problem with neoadjuvant hormone therapy is that you have to treat the patient for a long time, as my previous speaker said. It's about four to six months. That is the standard. In some cases, if the response keeps on go going, then you can wait up to six to eight months as well. Uh, the sandwich technique is... Uh, not practiced in most of the places because the standard principle is once the tumor is responding to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you have to complete all the planned cycles of chemotherapy. Now, the other point uh, here, in case of uh, uh, surgery, axillary dissection or axillary clearance or axillary sampling, after neoadjuvant, if there is clinical uh, complete response, well, for the primary tumor, there is no scope of skipping the surgery. But for the axillary, yes, if you go for sentinel dissection, sentinel lymph node dissection, if the, there is no uh, node staining or if you find that it, is, uh, it has gotten to complete response, then probably uh, if the pre-treatment evaluation showed only one or two lymph nodes and with treatment that has completely gone into uh, remission, you can probably ex uh, you can, uh, skip the uh, axillary dissection because you are going to radiate the axilla after surgery because the total treatment planning of a patient who is receiving neoadjuvant therapy is determined initially, not after response. Only the change in treatment plan is taken when there is no response to chemotherapy, immediately the patient is sent for uh, surgery. 
the other point I'm interested about is triple negative breast cancer. Uh, somebody put a question in the chat box, whether you want to give adjuvant, uh, extended uh, adjuvant capsitabine for all patients after uh, near adjuvant chemotherapy. Well, uh, the studies show that if the residual tumor is there after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then probably their benefit is there with uh, extended chemotherapy with capsitabine. Otherwise, there is numerical uh, improvement, but not really in, uh, in statistically significant manner. Neoadjuvant endocrine therapy I have talked about, but in TNBC, the other uh, important point is you have to go for uh, BRCA mutation testing for the patient as well as for the other for patient treatment selection subsequently and also for uh, the the uh, uh, offspring as well as the uh, uh, other uh, family members right so the both the speakers were excellent and the session has been an outstanding one thank you so much thanks all thank you mukherjee sir for your valuable and excellent comment i would like to request now uh, Vice President of our society, Selim Reja Sar, who is the Senior Consultant at Square Hospitals Limited. Selim Reja Sar, for your valuable comments. Thanks, Dr. Oldan Shaw, as you nicely conduct the session. An excellent presentation of the two speakers, my friend, Professor Nicholas from Australia and Dr. Jyoti Vaspi from Patan World Hospital, Mumbai, India. And from my side, nothing new uh, would be, uh, should be added. So I also offer my thanks to my old friends, Professor Ten from Singapore, Dr. Rajiv from Chennai, and Professor Mufajjal, Professor Wajiru Kadirbhai for your inter interactive uh, participations and your valuable comments. I have a simple uh, query to Professor Nicholas. Uh, we usually use the chemotherapy protocol, SC followed by Texan, weekly or three weekly. In which cases, we'll use the first detection that which, which will be followed by SE. Is there any criteria? So I would use um, taxane followed by AC. Um, I, I think that they're completely interchangeable. Uh, the NeoTango trial actually showed an increased pathological complete response rate, albeit only 5% additional for the taxane first approach. So I think that, that would be a very reasonable approach. Um, I tend to use AC first in patients who I think are fit, and that means that I can get that out of the way first. Um, but in patients who are less fit, I might use Taxane first and give them weekly Taxol so that they um, can get through that and it's a test of their fitness. Uh, so I think either way uh, is, is very appropriate. I would usually use weekly Paclitaxel. Uh, I'm tendency towards dose dense um, of AC and uh, for patient preference and convenience and it shortens the time of chemotherapy, I would use dose dense two weekly paclitaxel at 175 um, milligrams per meter squared. But I believe that that's actually equivalent to the uh, weekly regimen for 12 weeks. If anybody from the audience have any questions, then we will go towards the conclusion of the session. Can ask. Excellent presentation. It definitely helps Bangladeshi uh, surgeons, oncologists, you know, to exchange this knowledge. The question I was asking previously was to Prof. Nick, director, to um, if if there are ER positive elderly patients, the benefit of neoadjuvant um, chemotherapy instead of neoadjuvant hormone therapy, neoadjuvant hormone therapy would be more beneficial than neoadjuvant chemo. And yes, I wanted um, a little I bit of comment from Prof. Nick on that. And he has already responded. Uh, maybe this can be shared widely. Uh, but the neoadjuvant chemotherapy presentation was absolutely brilliant. Uh, but I wanted a little bit of comment from him about neoadjuvant hormone therapy, especially on certain trials. In fact, there are 20 randomized trials evaluated neoadjuvant endocrine therapy on selective ER positive a group of patients. Um, thank absolutely. You, and thank, thank you for the question. I agree completely that neoadjuvant endocrine therapy is well worthwhile, uh, particularly in the elderly patients, and, um, and it can be well tolerated in somebody who may not be a candidate for chemotherapy, for downstaging. Uh, and 
I, I mentioned in the uh, in my type response uh, that it can give an indication of PMS sensitivity, uh, and there's the um, from recollection the poetic trial um, where they did um, neoadjuvant endocrine therapy and found that there was a um, significant decrease in the Power 67 uh, that uh, patients uh, had a, a very good rate of response. And um, my uh, I mean, my brief was to uh, tonight to talk about or this afternoon to talk about chemotherapy, um, but I I agree completely that there are a lot of opportunities for endocrine therapy uh, alone in patients with estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative disease, uh, and um, that they um, may own that's maybe all that they need. I will note that there are. Um, there's a trial um, that I'm aware of recently published saying that patients should have surgery. Um, they should not just be treated with primary endocrine therapy alone. If their tumour is resectable, then at some point, maybe six months, nine months after starting, surgery would be worthwhile. Otherwise, they have inferior outcomes. Thank you very much. Excellent. Maybe we take an opportunity to ask a few more questions if I'm allowed. <laughs> yeah. In the um, meantime, you the can ask question, no problem. Yeah. Because there is a bit of gap. Uh, uh, there is a lot of practice goes on in Bangladesh of sandwich technique, you know, chemotherapy given halfway and then surgery and then remaining chemotherapy. I would like to hear your comment about that. And also, you, you thank you for mentioning marker clip insertion for prior near driven chemo because it was never practiced in 40 years in Bangladesh. Last three years, uh, I have taken this technology transfer and training many surgeons so that this has been newly practiced in the last three years, which is a great change for prospective near adjuvant chemotherapy patients who would have complete response. And thank you for mentioning this on your, on your talk. But I would like to hear your comment about sandwich technique, please. Certainly. So I think that patients um, are best to receive adequate dose density and intensity. And I think that ideally they should receive all of their chemotherapy first uh, and of the standard chemotherapy if they were to receive anthracycline taxane because um, if there is a gap, um, then there is the potential for um, the cancer to start to proliferate again. Um, so internationally, uh, the recommendations are for um, all of the chemotherapy to happen first rather than to have a... Um, some chemotherapy, then surgery, then um, other planned chemotherapy afterwards. And this is distinguished from post neoadjuvant therapy where it's the patients who have a poor pathological response who then may, might benefit from post neoadjuvant therapy. Um, with regard to the marker clip, um, I accept that um, for in some situations it can be um, expensive um, to put a clip in, which is why I mentioned the carbon track technique. Uh, and there are certainly surgeons here in Australia who use the carbon track technique uh, to mark the tumour, and that can be a very um, cost-effective marker strategy. Excellent. We will definitely try to learn this technique. My last question, Arunsha, to Professor Nick, if I'm allowed. I was quite worried about hearing some practices in Bangladesh that post-completion near given chemo with good clinical radiological response no surgery is offered in axilla or breast. Is it a recommendation would you make, Prof. Nick? Thank you. I would, I would strongly recommend, based on the trials demonstrating that there is disease recurrence, even in the event of complete clinical response, patients experience disease recurrence and progression. Uh, and this um, can be, in those sort of patients, a um, potentially life-threatening um, problem. Uh, and therefore, I would recommend that patients have chemotherapy followed by surgery to both breast and axilla. And at a minimum, axillary nodal, um, a sentinel node biopsy, um, alternatively, an axillary clearance, uh, depending on the situation, um, because I, I don't think we have sufficiently uh, accurate, uh, sensitive, even with MRI, PET scan, ultrasound, everything, it's not enough to say that there's definitely going to be a pathological complete response. Excellent. Thank you very much that it has come from you. Thank, thank you. We for the take question. this message. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody have uh, quick questions to Jyoti, madam, uh, please ask because madam is in between 
our examination. We are very thankful to Jyoti Madam for managing time and coming to our session. She might have to leave after some time for uh, exam related some issues. So if anybody, um, Shahida Apa, Lima Apa, you have a question. I, I have. Jyoti Madam, okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. I have to Jyoti Madam. Yeah. Yeah, please. So congrats for the wonderful presentation. I just want to know the cut-off is of ovarian suppression in the light of uh, soft text trial because there is, it is less than 35. But would you prefer uh, ovarian suppression of the not positive patients, say 37 or 38 years of age? Right. So uh, the, the data is most robust for less than 35 years age, as you said, but we can consider giving it to 37, 38. Also, they are also pretty young. If there is heavy nodal uh, you know, positivity, uh, then I would I would consider giving them as well. Right, so, so upper cutoff is what is your upper cutoff? Forty years? Uh, you know, it is, it's not a very uh, you know tight uh, compartment, but uh, we can say that uh, you know uh, younger age per, you know per se is also a high risk feature or uh, high risk factor for recurrence. So this is one of the factor as age advances the recurrence risk. Uh, goes down so we have to uh, you know uh, weigh the thing that how much nodes so not only age is one criteria then you have to say what is the nodal status what are the other features what are the size you know those all features took together and then we have to uh, you know take a call and also we have to weigh the risk of uh, toxicity so what is the right term of doing this ovarian suppression just uh, suppose that i'm planning to do a ovarian suppression for a high risk patient but the patient is having post amenuria. So should I take uh, the advantage of this natural suppression or I should do this ovarian suppression just within six months uh, with, the, with this amenuria? No, when a when, uh, patient already attained an amenuria, it might be permanent also, then you should uh, wait. That for, that's what is uh, you know, our uh, strategy. And, and later on, you can decide if patients are again resuming menstruation. Then, uh, then, then you can think for uh, so um, can I, uh, thank you. Just, just, doctor, uh, I am Professor Mufajal, medical oncologist. If someone has a, 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 a breast cancer and giving abdominal chemotherapy, and he, she develops uh, uh, menopause in the in the age group of 45, 50, or around that, will you be waiting for the natural uh, menopause or natural uh, cessation, or it has stopped it? It has stopped. Uh, the patient has stopped menstruating. Will you be waiting for the uh, uh, subsequent events or you can just go for the uh, hormonal uh, estimations? What do you do? We'll be waiting or just uh, estimate the hormones, estrogen, so, progesterone, LH, follicular stimulative hormone, and then you can come to an assessment whether she has gone into a permanent menopause or not. But 12 months is a standard practice, isn't it? Right. So cessation of menstruation and the continuous cessation for uh, for 12 months is considered a definition for uh, menopause when it is induced menopause due to uh, you know chemotherapy and if patient is really young we have to be very careful because if we start her uh, start the patient on aromatase inhibitor that, that may even be detrimental so uh, so we we have to follow that how patient is doing at times they give uh, complaints of spotting in between as well, and uh, and and we have to measure the E2 levels. You know when they are uh, post chemo induced, uh, you know disturbances, hormonal disturbances. Many times FSH LH are misleading, and E2 levels are more uh, you know reliable. So we have to check these hormone levels and we have to repeat these hormone levels also. Then only we should uh, confirm that that this is a true true menopause or not. And generally, as the women are more young, there are, there are high chances that they will, uh, you know, their hormone level fluctuates more and they will, many times they regain, they again resume, uh, resumption of menstruation happens. Can I ask to uh, return Nicolas? And, uh, actually, um, thanks for your nice presentation. I learned a lot of, uh, from you. Uh, I have one question regarding the fertility preservation. When we do, uh, diagnose a case of uh, breast cancer in a young lady, with um, triple negative breast cancer, poorly differentiated, and decided to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Then the question came for the uh, fertility preservation. 
when we uh, refer this patient to um, a, a fertility a doctor gynecologist and um, actually the time uh, for the uh, ovary preservation or oocyte freezing this method took time and uh, mm. actually uh, can you say that how many time needed for this uh, purpose for fertility, fertility preservation and if we wait for the this uh, this things and delay the near starting the near driven chemotherapy is uh, defer for treatment uh, or outcome of the treatment yeah I, that's a good question because it is difficult uh, the patients who have triple negative breast cancer you want to get treated get their chemotherapy started as soon as possible and in the neoadjuvant setting that might be the following week and the fertility preservation um, ovarian um, stimulation and then oocyte harvest can take up to four weeks depending on the menstrual cycle sometimes it's shorter but um, sometimes not uh, and that means that their chemotherapy is delayed. I, in, in those situations, if there is a, um, depending on the risk level of the tumour type, I would consider um, an operation and concurrent um, oocyte harvest. Uh, and so that means that they're recovering from surgery and they can then proceed to adjuvant therapy within a reasonable time frame. We've got data showing that the um, time from surgery to chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer matters and it should occur within four weeks of surgery we don't have that data in the neoadjuvant setting uh, but i suspect that it's very similar so you recommend surgery first in this case i would if if the patient has high risk disease i'd still do neoadjuvant chemotherapy and just um, organize the egg harvest as soon as possible but it, it's all a spectrum so if you um, consider everything together if they've got relatively low risk disease then you could consider uh, and they're very keen on um, having um, oocyte preservation fertility preservation then you could consider giving them I, I don't think that they have to have neoadjuvant therapy but as you can see, I'm quite an advocate for the neoadjuvant approach and I would prefer if it's at all feasible. And there are other options as well. I mean, if they're very young, um, then they could have um, gazerolin, ovarian suppression, um, which has been shown to uh, help preserve uh, fertility. Um, and um, so they may be able to regain their fertility um, <laughs> after, after chemotherapy without resorting to needing uh, frozen eggs or frozen embryos. Uh, Thank you. Uh, um, actually, Dr. recently Rona. my three patient uh, mm -hmm. refused to uh, preserve the fertility preservation uh, because of delay. Uh, can you uh, say that if we try for the preservation after first chemo, any chance, uh, but any recommendation? Um, I, I guess that has the potential to delay the next cycle of chemotherapy. And so I'm... I would be a, a, a bit reluctant uh, with that sort of an approach uh, and it wouldn't be considered uh, standard. Uh, I, I, I prefer, as I mentioned before, to maintain uh, the dose intensity and have the chemotherapy delivered at the prescribed intervals. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks for kind answer. Oruna, uh, I ask Oruna for sure? Yes, Lemapa. Please. If you allow, Dr. Ranti, yeah, uh, I would like to share one of my experience, and I think it is very relevant to the management of young patient management challenge. Recently, I have seen two patients who were having post chemoamenuria, and they, one of the patients advised radiotherapy, and another is on tamoxifen. But after six, seven months of tamoxifen, now the patient is. Uh, uh, complaining of enlargement of abdomen. So we are examined and do an ultrasonography. Now she's pregnant with a six month of viable pregnancy. So I think uh, we should uh, do a routine a pregnancy test in every young patient having uh, post chemoamenuria before advising the tamoxifen or radiotherapy. And another patient, she was having radiotherapy with this pregnancy ongoing. So uh, this is very important for the young patient to have a pregnancy test before this type of therapy. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, it's, it's important to uh, counsel the patients at the completion of chemotherapy that even if they have amenorrhea, they still are potentially fertile. 
and uh, need to take appropriate precautions to avoid pregnancy. So uh, the issue raised by Dr. Nafisa is very vital, I think. Uh, sometimes very young patients are coming with triple negative breast cancer, very advanced disease, and uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is needed. But uh, there are issues of ovarian function suppressions as well. So this is a very complex dilemma. Uh, how Sir, to solve Dr. it? Dr. Unangshu, may I ask a question to Dr. Nicholas? Hello? Yes, sure. Ah, thank Should you be. so much. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, I have two questions. Uh, number one is regarding the concept uh, on the fertility issue. That is, uh, whenever a young patient is, uh, uh, when we, uh, you, you are thinking or you uh, suggest fertility restoration after the completion of therapy, all those therapy, all the uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and number two question, uh, when do you suggest a genetic study in a young woman? When it is triple negative or uh, you suggest it routinely for every patient in young patient? So fertility restoration I take to mean uh, that when would I suggest that a patient might try for a pregnancy? So we don't know ultimately when that's safe. However, I will say that pregnancy after breast cancer does not increase the risk of recurrence. Uh, and so it is safe from a breast cancer perspective, but the underlying risk from the breast cancer remains. It's, uh, there are some data suggesting that it is slightly protective against recurrence. Uh, and so having a baby, I'd typically say um, wait for two years uh, and then uh, they can try for um, a year or so uh, with early fertility um, techniques, uh, seeing a fertility specialist, uh, and then uh, if they are unsuccessful uh, after that one year or so, then um, they should um, go back to their adjuvant uh, endocrine therapy uh, for the ER positive patients. Uh, and the, um, the second question, sorry, just, um, just remind me. Uh, yes, uh, the second question was that uh, genetic study is... Uh, when, to, when to do genetic for... studies, yes, yes. thank you. Uh, so the um, genetics, I use the Manchester school. So the Manchester criteria, um, you can um, ha download the Manchester sorting criteria and that will take into account the patient and their family history and give an appropriate score uh, for if they've got a risk of a gene mutation of more than 10%, then uh, I would recommend testing. Uh, if it's less than 10%, then we would not recommend testing. So it's patients who have triple negative breast cancer and they're less than 40 years of age, patients who are triple negative breast cancer and one first degree relative who are less than 50 years of age, um, if they have bilateral breast cancer and one of which is a triple negative, if they have uh, an ovarian cancer, serious ovarian cancer of high grade, then they should have genetic testing. Um, and uh, then, then you take into account family history as well from either one side or the other. But the Man I think Manchester criteria are uh, fairly straightforward to, to use. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if there is no more question. Hey, hello. Uh, Hi. Is there any, yeah. yeah. Start, Hi. Can I ask Dr. Nicholas a rather controversial question? In the new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy for triple negative, do you, if the patient has got BRCA mutation, do you add in carboplatin as part of the chemotherapy regime? And also, what is uh, there has been studies to show that patients uh, with triple negative, if they have a high PL1 score, that the role of immunotherapy together with chemotherapy might give a better results for the triple negative. What are your comments? So carboplatin in the BRCA population increases the rate of pathological complete response, but it has not yet been shown to increase the disease-free or overall survival. And as such, I will use it if I want to give the maximum possible response because of surgical reasons, but 
I won't do it. And I, I have prescribed carboplatin with neoadjuvant chemotherapy along with the tactane. Uh, I'd usually use um, a weekly uh, AUC 1.5 of carboplatin along with the taxane. Uh, the um, for the occasional patient who needs a, a good response if they've got a large locally advanced tumour. Uh, and uh, so with the uh, immunotherapy, actually uh, the pdl one status is less important in the uh, neoadjuvant setting for pdl one uh, for immunotherapy. It's important in metastatic disease, uh, but likewise, um, you know, I, I think that it's going to turn out to be important. I think that neoagent immunotherapy is going to be quite worthwhile for the triple negative patients. Uh, and we're, but we're yet to um, work out where exactly um, it should be used. Uh, like it, it's, uh, it increases the pathological complete response rate and to a, quite a high level in some patients is very impressive. Um, so I, um, I think that I have optimism about um, neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Um, but as uh, Eric Weiner has said on multiple occasions, um, that we should stop praying at the altar of PCR. And so PCR is something that is makes us feel good, but do, it doesn't correlate with a difference in trial outcomes. So if you see a um, PCR difference in a trial and then do an adjuvant trial of the same combination, you may not see and you probably won't see a difference between the arms unless there is a huge difference in PCR. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Rajiv one question. Sir, is there any scenario, usually in the neoadjuvant setting, we give anthracycline first followed by taxan. So is there any scenario where you will alter, like you will start with paclitaxel carboplatin followed by uh, anthracycline? So, which may be the scenario why you will prefer starting with Texan, a fit patient, fitness where is not an issue. Rajiv, sir. Yeah. I think as Professor Nicholas has mentioned, we have enough evidence to show that uh, either you intertween uh, Texan followed by anthracycline or anthracycline followed by Texan, there is no um, uh, significant difference in survival. Uh, so I would add weekly paclitaxel initially in patients who have poor performance status or you feel anthracycline may not be fit. So that one may be one uh, situation where I would add a tax aid. Um, the second uh, one where uh, there is uh, HER2 positive, then it is, uh, and if you are planning anthracycline, then I would reverse. So I would usually give anthracycline, uh, AC, I finish it off, and then add tax aid with uh, trastuzumab plus pertuzumab because only MD Anderson has been combining anthracycline plus trastuzumab with not much added risk, but the general guidelines is to uh, uh, not to combine anthracycline and trastuzumab. So usually in my practice, most of the time it is AC followed by T, but in patients whom I need some time for they to be fit for AC, I would add uh, taxi. Uh, we also in our institute, we had a study where we were trying to give a concurrent chemo radiotherapy uh, in a very locally advanced uh, breast cancer where we were looking at combining chemotherapy and radiotherapy like we do for carcinoma rectum. And there, weekly paclitaxel is a good combination because it is a radio sensitizer and also it uh, chemo radiotherapy becomes more feasible in a clinical trial setting. So these are the two situations which I have used taxane upfront. And in HER2 positive, I've always used the taxane slate. And so, so the next question is, Thank you, sir. then come that, in, hello? Yeah. If, if it's HER2 positive, uh, yes. so taxane and, uh, taxan and trastuzumab at first, and then uh, can you switch to AC? Because there will be a gap so, between. Uh, so that that's not a um, uh, feasible uh, uh, sequence. Why I would tell because let's say if you are uh, decided to avoid anthracyclines with uh, some of the recent controversial data where they say that anthracycline may not have much role and you are looking at a TCH sort of regimen, then yes, taxane we will start along with uh, trastuzumab. But if you have planned that you you are uh, you have significant locally advanced disease and you need anthracycline in place, 
then more logical sequence would be to have anthracycline get it off and then do a repeat echocardiogram and make sure we are fine and then add taxin plus trastuzumab otherwise if we start with taxin plus trastuzumab then we when we go back to ac then there will be a break for trastuzumab uh, you know the sequencing so we should avoid that so if you are giving trastuzumab it should be continuous and another place where i would use only paclitaxel and trastuzumab will be in a very low risk early stage disease where i am going to completely avoid anthracycline and this based on the uh, us data where it is only weekly paclitaxel plus trastuzumab for 12 cycles followed by trastuzumab that's in very early stage erpr positive favorable low grade disease i would use weekly paclitaxel plus trastuzumab but in our regular locally advanced breast cancer if we have decided to use anthracycline in her to positive disease my sequence is ac then follow it up with taxin plus trastuzumab plus pertuzumab but all these will happen before surgery so as uh, professor nicholas mentioned that uh, we are going to complete the new adjuvant therapy and only change if the the sequence if there is no pca then we might consider addition of uh, tdm1 thank you sir <laughs> thank you very much we are almost at the end of our uh, session at this point i would like to request president of our society which is bangladesh press cancer study forum i would like to request professor kamrul jaman choudhury sir for your valuable comment and to conclude this session kamrul jaman sir uh, thank you dr rangshu uh, today we had our uh, brilliant two speakers especially uh, dr uh, nicolas from australia he was coming for couple of years in bangladesh uh, in breast cancer conference and uh, and uh, he has given a very nice uh, evidence based uh, uh, presentations regarding the new adjuvant therapy in breast cancer and and dr jyoti has uh, enlightened uh, enlightened but but with his uh, good uh, presentations especially uh, the treatments in early breast cancer especially young breast cancer patients and Uh, both the presentation really excellence and uh, and both of the speakers actually attached with our societies and coming for couple of years in bangladesh and giving uh, updating regarding breast cancer management say in this uh, uh, in our countries and also globally in these regions so uh, they have nicely uh, presented uh, uh, given give good presentations and we are, we are updated regarding their presentations really really i am very happy because tan is uh, with us professor tan from singapore is with us for a couple again more than 15 to 20 years uh, in ban coming our uh, in the our breast cancer conference and also kidney cancer conference and and, and every time uh, he's uh, uh, updating us with his uh, this time uh, we had a uh, dr rajiv from apollo chennai uh, breast cancer management especially and what he is doing in uh, is uh, in india especially in chennai and uh, we hope that uh, they will be with us in in coming webinars and also in the next year in 2021 we are arranging the breast cancer for which situation improves improves and we will be happy if they uh, come in the next year to attend the conference and uh, provide available uh, presentations in the conference and among uh, the actually seminar we have a uh, colleagues uh, professor mufazzal has given his ideas about the breast cancer management and what is uh, yeah and uh, his experience and in the bangladesh scenario especially uh, and, and dr selim also um, has given his opinion and professor mufazzal kader also given his opinions really we are happy a lot of uh, uh, participants attended this webinar and we are updated regarding the recent managements uh, in terms of uh, Uh, chemotherapy is new adjuvants and also in young patient how we treat the patients in uh, uh, in uh, managing the breast cancer patient early uh, early ages especially so we hope uh, this webinar will be continue and we i uh, think professor uh, jyoti and professor nicolas and uh, rajiv and all of them will be uh, attached with this webinars and we hope they will participate in the next year in the coming years in the breast cancer conference thank you Thank you, Kamru Jaman sir, for your valuable comments. And uh, Hi sir is there. We would like to hear few words from Hi sir. We are almost at the end, sir. We.
we have, we have completed our question and answer sessions and discussions as well. I have nothing more to comment. Question and answer sessions are also very good. Because I see my old friend, Dan, he used to come very frequently to Bangladesh because of COVID. Better that you see you can talk to you from our own experience. Thank you all very much for attending and coming and enlightening us with the numerous knowledges. Your so, answer, please complete. Um, before Thank we finish, right. uh, just a few announcements that. Uh, our society is going to collaborate with Global Cancer Institute, which is called GCI. They have agreed to do a joint tumor board with us every month at the end uh, last Monday. So I'd like to thank Kapu Jaman Sa, Selim Rajas Sar, and all of our team members, uh, Shaujol Lugnapa, for collaborating this event. This is really a great initiative. Two or three of the faculties from Global Cancer Institute will participate in the case discussion. Initially from our society, we will launch two or three cases and uh, they will give valuable comments on it. We are expecting this is going to be a very good academic discussion. The first one is going to happen on 28th of this month, which is the Monday. Detail we will send and links and everything very soon. So we are very happy to have this collaboration. And our next CME will be two weeks from now, which is 25th of September, will be on breast radiotherapy. We are work working with our uh, faculties. We will inform all informations very soon. Thank you, dear participants, for being with us. Thank you, Hi Sir, for giving your valuable time. Thank you, Selim Reja Sar and Kamru Jaman Sar, our Vice President and President of the Society. And thank you, our faculty. Thank you, Nicholas, Rajiv, and Dan Sar for giving your time. Thank you all for active participation. Thank you, Lugnapa. Thank you.